are uh, located in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we're an educational nonprofit accelerating uh, medical XR research and development. Uh, we have built a uh, library uh, of um, uh, almost 50 talks at this point uh, that are educational, that talk about the journey of the medical XR innovator. Uh, uh, today, uh, uh, oh, before, before we get started, um, I'd like you to um, uh, uh, take a look uh, in, the, in the chat where I'll put upcoming talks. Uh, we have a, a talk coming up um, uh, uh, from Mixer uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, Mixer is a, a joint uh, R&D effort between uh, University of Maryland, University of uh, Illinois, and the University of, uh, of Michigan. Uh, and it is uh, supported by uh, uh, National Science Foundation and some of the uh, commercial companies in, in the XR space. Um, and it should be a, uh, an interesting talk with the principal uh, investigators from, from that uh, consortium. Uh, and after that, we're, uh, uh, we have a talk um, about uh, globally um, uh, training, uh, uh, tra tra training, training surgeons uh, to meet the, the, the global, global demands. Uh, so I'll put that link in uh, so you can, uh, can have a look and decide if you'd, you'd like to attend. Uh, we um, uh, we made a change uh, a while back um, uh, to have moderators with um, domain experience, and um, uh, um, uh, because it just makes for a better talk. Uh, and today, uh, I'm pleased uh, that we have Claudio Capelli. Uh, Dr. Capelli is a senior researcher at the University College London in the Greater Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, he um, uh, earned a doctorate in biomedical engineering from uh, the University of Central uh, London and has authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications focused on patient-specific modeling and simulation, uh, medical devices, and virtual reality. Uh, like, like many of us, uh, he's, he's been working in, in VR uh, for, for quite some time, uh, and since um, uh, 2018, he's been at the forefront of integrating virtual reality into medical education, planning, and communications. Uh, in 2002, he founded uh, VHearts, uh, dedicated to, to delivering customized medical solutions. And with that, I'll turn things over to uh, you, Claudio, uh, and um, looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's a really great pleasure to moderate this session and in particular to introduce uh, Jennifer Silva. Jennifer, uh, as you will recognize from the very first slide, uh, she has uh, multiple lives. Uh, she is a practicing clinician, she's a researcher, uh, she's an innovator, and uh, she is also an entrepreneur who founded not one but two companies uh, to date. And uh, so I think uh, in this particular era of the uh, where in which the technology is advancing so quickly it's uh, very important to hear about the success story and understanding how the technology can meet the uh, clinical needs and that actually how the clinical needs should drive innovation to quote one of the uh, the title of one of uh, Jennifer's uh, recent paper so I'm looking forward to hear and learn from Jennifer how the journey that uh, she has conducted, she's conducting, can really bring us to um, understanding where uh, AR and VR technologies can serve and be mostly useful for improving uh, the healthcare in general. So without further ado, I uh, let, uh, inter um, invite Jennifer to, to take the floor and I will, during the session, I will read the Q&A uh, uh, session. The, there is a Q&A chat uh, where you can put uh, your questions that I will uh, gladly uh, forward to Jennifer at the end of the session. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation to come here today. Thank you, Claudio, for the very kind introduction. Let me see if I can. We had tested this in advance, but I'm hoping that I am able to share screens and that you are all able to see them. Yes, correct. Excellent. Go ahead. Thank you. So 
As Claudia mentioned, my name is Jennifer Silva. I am a practicing pediatric electrophysiologist here in St. Louis at Washington University. We're gonna get into what that is in a few minutes. Uh, I'm also the faculty fellow in entrepreneurship, which means that I encourage faculty that have smart ideas that they think are going to change the way we practice medicine to try doing that, to try taking their technology out of the university. I am also the co-founder and co-inventor for the technologies that you're going to hear about today, both for Centiar and for Xera. So I obviously do have several disclosures. Um, the disclosures that are going to be relevant to what we're talking about today are my relationships with Centiar and Xera. I do want to fully disclose that I also serve um, as a board member for MedVR and then the research support from the relative companies, relevant companies. So. I thought I would talk a little bit about my background because I we, I don't actually know um, many of the people on the call. I know some of them. I saw some familiar names. Uh, I did college at, actually in upstate New York and got my bachelor's in arts in philosophy uh, and biology and then went to medical school in Grenada. I came back to the States and did my pediatrics residency. Miami, and then started my pediatric cardiology fellowship actually here in St. Louis from 2005 to 2008. I got my bachelor's in arts and philosophy. Uh, that's an echo. Stephen, do you mind muting? Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go from there. So I, at, when I was doing my pediatric cardiology fellowship here in St. Louis, I actually joined an engineering lab. I was in the lab for several years. Here's a picture of my lab mates. It was a really um, formative time in my education and, and in my development as a clinician. One of the projects that I was actually working on there was spun out into a company and actually ended up getting acquired by Medtronic. Um, but while I was there, I met a couple of very people who would actually have a very important role in my life. Um, one is my husband. So we actually did meet in the lab. He is in this um, pink shirt, and in fact, as an engineer. I went, I left St. Louis, I went to Boston where I trained specifically in cardiac electrophysiology and ended up coming back to St. Louis for my first and to this day, my only faculty position, partially because of this man. This is Dr. Van Hare. He actually now works for FDA. The circle is fully full and complete. Um, but at the time, he was a practicing pediatric electrophysiologist, and it was really important to me when I started my clinical, um, my attending work, that I really knew my craft really well. And this is something that I tell people all the time. It's important to know your clinical space so that you can actually identify the gaps. But the gaps just aren't what you perceive to be the gaps, but the gaps are actually what you have experienced during your practice. So I came back in 2009. Um, I've been an attending here ever since. And I was actually acting as a consultant for multiple companies in the EP space. I had both of my kids in that time. And then in 2016, founded originally what we called MHS, but was rebranded to Centier in 2016. And then Xera most recently in 2021. So my career has sort of been interlaced as first and foremost a clinician but working with industry to make sure that we can de deliver better care to our patients, not just my patients, but to everybody's patients. Well, there we go. Okay, so I thought I would just to, um, to level the playing field, start with a little bit about what cardiac electrophysiology is. When people think of the heart, they think of blockages and coronaries, and that's all very important. And I care not about none of it. I only care about the electrical part of the heart. I care about the conduction system. So heart physiologists are the electricians of the heart is how we like to think of ourselves. So we know that there is a normal electrical system, but we know that that can go haywire and you can have abnormal rhythms that either come from the top parts of the heart, what we call atrial tachycardias, or abnormal rhythms that come from the bottom chambers of the heart. Those are ventricular tachycardias. Um, we deal with heart rhythms that are either too fast or too slow. My personal favorite, I like faster things rather than slower things. And this ended up being the focus of much of my research. 
So how do we treat tachycardias or fast heart rates? Well, generally we can either use medication. Um, those often work, they have side effects. We can have a whole separate conversation about that. Or we treat them with a minimally invasive procedure called a cardiac catheter ablation, or also known as an electrophysiology study. I will use those terms interchangeably. So what does that look like? What does an ablation procedure look like? Um, well, to start, I do these two days a week. We do about four a week. And what we do is we put catheters or these long flexible wires through the large vessels, often in the leg, sometimes in the neck, other places. And we thread these catheters up into the heart. And what we're doing when we do this is we're looking to figure out where the normal electrical system is and then where the abnormal electrical short circuits are so that we can try to target those to get rid of it. That's just fix that right there. Um, how do we do this? We, you can see here, this is a fluoroscopy image of the catheters in the heart. You can see these little spots on those catheters. Those are electrodes. And what we do is we measure the electrical activity between those electrodes. And that looks something like this. And we call these electrograms. Um, electrograms are one of my most favorite. I dream about these. I think they're so beautiful. But these tell me everything that I need to know about what's going on relative to those catheters. When I, I, I hesitate to say this, but as I was training, a very important technology was being introduced to the market. We call that electroanatomic mapping. And what these very clever engineers did was they said, these electrograms are hard for everybody to interpret. We're going to create a map. And that map is going to help the clinician figure out um, what areas are electrically happening earlier than other areas. And these maps that we were created, we called electroanatomic maps or EAMS. You'll see that also throughout this presentation. And the way that these data are delivered to the clinician is on a, a panel with two orthogonal projections, just quite frankly, like our fluoroscopy does. And it's the electrophysiologist, part of their job, to take these two discrete maps of the same patient and recreate an electrical, uh, a 3D model in their heads. Once we do all that, we've got to figure out where we want to ablate. Where is the abnormal electrical short circuit that is allowing the patient to have these abnormal fast heart rhythms? And then we try to ablate those or get rid of those. There's various forms of energy that you can use to do that. That is beyond the scope of what we are going to discuss today. Um, but this sort of is, what we do during an EP study. And this is, a, I found this, this picture is from online. This is a picture of what an EP lab looks like. You have um, the operator standing at the head of the, at the, usually at the groin, which is where we call our workstation. And then you have a person sitting at your mapping system, at your pacing system, and then at your ablation generator. So all of these different pieces of the, um, lab, have different pieces of equipment, there's no interoperability between them, and you need a separate person manning each station to run that system for you. That means it gets a little complicated, right? Because not only do I need to focus on the data that I have coming in, I need to also tell the other people in the room that are working with me on this patient what I need them to be doing. And while we went through the person who does the pacing, the person who does the mapping, the person who turns on and off the generators. We also have an anesthesiologist who is, of course, doing the very important work of keeping our patient um, alive and well during our procedure. So the problem that we first identified, and, and let me be clear, the problems have evolved and changed over time, multifold. And this is actually a picture of my lab. So you can tell this is a pediatrics lab because it's cheerful and it's sunny and there's pictures of suns and birds in the background, was that the visualization was kind of poor, right? Looking at these two-dimensional images and recreating a 3D model, um, while it might be something a person is very good at, it's really very rudimentary in its visualization. The control, I didn't have any control, right? Because my hands were on a catheter and I needed to use my words to have other people in the lab do what it was that I needed them to do. 
we obviously have a connectivity issue. As I mentioned, all of these systems, they don't really talk to each other. And then of course the decision support, there is no decision support. The decision support is um, whatever the decision that I make during the case. So lots of issues that we were able to identify. So while we had identified these problems, we knew that there were technologies being developed and we knew that virtual reality had been out there where, and this is gonna be very um, intuitive for this group to know, where the digital fully replaces the physical world. And you know, we all have really good examples and probably multiple headsets of these at home. The reason that we never moved forward with virtual reality in the lab was I, as a physician, was really nervous about putting a box over my head. Not for certain things, but when I'm doing the procedure, that seemed like a barrier I wasn't sure I could cross. Okay, well, then you, I actually remember it very um, clearly. There was a, um, a case report that came out of Poland looking at the use of Google Glass in a patient who needed um, a stent procedure in interventional cardiology. Right, And I remember reading this article and saying, the technology is so close. We are so close to being able to take AR into the lab. Look, they were able to do. So examples of this, Google Glass is, is, this, is the classic example that I use. Then came mixed reality. And, and we were introduced to mixed reality. Um, my co-founder and co-inventor, who's also my husband, John Silva, was at a Microsoft meeting where they were talking about the development of what ended up being HoloLens. And we're trying to think through what were potential applications for it across all enterprises, not across healthcare. And it was during that meeting that on a phone call that he and I came up with the idea of trying to take a mixed reality system into the EP lab to see if we could start addressing some of the issues that we have. So you now know a little bit about electrophysiology. You all probably know more about the hardware of these systems than I ever could. But let me break down an EP study into its parts. Every EP study has general parts. You've got the pre-procedural planning for your procedure. You've got your patient prep and anesthesia. You've got vascular access. You have the diagnostic portion of your study where you're building your maps and figuring out where you're going to ablate. You have the therapeutic part where you actually do the ablation. And then you have the post-ablation EP study. And what I've underlaid to the map of the EP study are all of the various areas that we are seeing the extended realities all the way from VR to XR impacting EP studies. And we're gonna just focus on two um, because those are the technologies that we've been working on, the command EP system, and then we will um, touch briefly on the Mantis system. So let's talk a little bit about what the command EP system is. The command EP system, um, this is actually version one, interfaced with an electroanatomic mapping system to take 3D data that had been compressed into 2D, run it through our proprietary software, and then deliver to the electric to the proceduralist a real-time visualization of the map with the real-time catheter locations. So what we were starting to enable was connection between the systems in the room, improvements in visualization, and then importantly, um, the physicians are able to manipulate these models however they wish. So we were starting to give the physician back control of their um, procedure. So this is an old video, but I think it's sometimes nice to see where your, your history and where you've come. You can see this is a Microsoft HoloLens 1, you can see that I'm pointing and clicking a lot with my fingers. We're gonna get into that in a second. We thought it was really important to have a connected environment so multiple people in the lab could understand what it was that the procedure list was. Um, and we had the ability to, you know, some very rudimentary things, move the map around the room, et cetera. So this is where we started. And we took, that into what we called our observational or our engineering study. Um, and this is sort of the advantage of having multiple members on your team who have what I call orthogonal skill sets, right? So we have engineers, we have clinician, we have all different people on our team. So we took patients that were scheduled for EP studies 
because they needed an EP study and ablation, we consented them for the procedure, their usual procedure. The patient experienced no change. They went through their procedure the way they would standardly have an EP study. But what we did was we separately had an observing team sitting outside of the cath lab that were watching the procedure through the headset. At the end of the procedure, we allowed any team member to review the study through the headset. And what we were really looking to measure were performance metrics off the device. Could the system handle the large quantities of data that were getting sent around the room? And could they do it in a latency that wasn't impacting the clinician or the case? Now, our observing team outside of the room consisted of a pediatric electrophysiologist and an engineer. It's important to note, there was no direct communication between these two teams during the procedure. So uh, these data, which were published um, by my colleague and co-founder, Mike Southworth in IEEE, were the original 10 patients that went through the engineering study. And in this table, we have a lot of clinical data up front. What were their electrophysiology diagnoses, diagnoses? What were the geometries that were created? What kind of map? Okay. But this is what we were interested in. We saw that we were able to create some pretty complex anatomies, that the frame rate that we were able to display those anatomies were between 30 and 60 frames per second, that the battery life on the headset was 190 minutes or so. Um, just for context, I should tell you that generally my procedures don't last longer than three hours. I think I don't think I'm superiorly fast or slow compared to my colleagues. And then the latency that we had in the initial system was less than 131 milliseconds. So we thought, okay, this isn't bad, but we know we can do better. And we know that as technology improves, that our maps are going to become more complex. We want to be able to display um, high fidelity, uh, easy to look at maps with longer performance if we can on the headset and shorter latency has always been a very important thing that we've looked at. And so we refined the software and then ran simulations and we were able to get our latency close to a hundred milliseconds, which was a good next iteration. Version four took us well below a hundred milliseconds and the battery life we were able to extend. So that's, that's interesting, right? Good engineering teams will find ways to make this happen for us needy clinicians. But something really important happened during the engineering study. I went back and I think, I don't know if these were my cases, but here, here are two examples. So in this, in this study here, there's a patient's right atrium, left atrium, coronary sinus, so three geometries being displayed. This is a still image taken after the procedure and the person is looking at it afterwards, just trying to understand, okay, does this look what I was look like what I was looking at in the lab? Here's another case. This was um, a patient who had a right atrial and a coronary sinus geometry. Here you can actually see what the mapping system showed in those two flat images, but they're also looking through it afterwards to see, okay, did, did that... 3D match up to what I was thinking I was looking at in my head. After one of those cases though, which was my case, I went back and looked at this patient. So this patient had a left um, atrial pathway, left-sided pathway. And this is what I had looked at in the lab. This was, these were my maps. And you can see here, my goal during this procedure was to create a, a tight cluster of lesions around where that spot was so that I could get rid of that spot. And I thought I had done a pretty reasonable job. The kid had done well, I felt good about myself. And then I went ahead and I looked through um, the Sentier system and I saw something really important. I saw this red dot, which marks where I placed a lesion that looks kind of far away from the rest of my cluster. And I thought to myself, well, I didn't realize I was so far away. If I was that far away, maybe I shouldn't have put that lesion in there. And this brought to mind a very important question, which was, can this tool actually improve our ability to navigate accurately during our procedures? 
So this became a question that I've been quite frankly hunting ever since 2017. In the midst of all that though, we took this, um, this uh, system and we put it through human factors testing. And this was a really important learning experience for us. So we completed it actually with EP docs across the country. And I intentionally made sure I didn't know very well because I didn't want positive feedback. I wanted critical feedback. And they actually gave us some really important advice, which significantly altered the user interface and control mechanisms. There were a couple things. First, um, we were using gaze gesture and they really didn't want that. They wanted our hands, they, they, you know, as I said, our hands are on catheters. We can't be pointing and clicking during a procedure. So we really had to move to a um, hands, a fully hands-free way of, of manipulating, controlling, or interacting with the system. But the most important information they gave us was to keep it intuitive. Um, and, and I think that is actually critically important. We ended up, oh, that, that is on the wrong thing, taking out voice control because once we had built it, turned out it wasn't quite ready for prime time. And so this is what the current command EP system looks, or actually still one version back. So the physician would, we envision would don the headset. Then there's this open white circle, which acts as your cursor. And that follows your head around. And that basically acts um, as, as a mouse would, quite frankly, for your regular computer. And then as the user hovers over something, it clicks or activates that button. Once the model is anchored in the room, you could look around the corner at it. We spend a lot of time developing a clipping plane. This allows the physician to clip away um, at the model that they're looking at. We've worked at creating joint sessions. We think that this will be important for the training of electrophysiologists in the future, not something that's been studied yet, but we can talk about later. I know this is an interesting area for Claudio. Um, the ability to turn or move your model however you wish. So we designed these um, rings that, that allow you to push the model away in any um, direction or to use the standard um, views that we use during the procedure. And then of course the ability to zoom. This is always uh, fun for users to use early on. We find that they haven't actually used it once they get past three or four cases. Okay, so once we had a system, we said, okay, this is good, but how about some clinical evidence generation? Like, how's this thing really gonna behave? We created, um, we, we put together what we called the CARE study or the Cardiac Augmented Reality Study. And, and this study had three hypotheses. The first was that the, the imaging, we'll call it holographic imaging, we can talk about that later too, will improve point navigation and accuracy. And, and this came directly from the last engineering study that we had done. Uh, learning as we were going, we still continue to learn as we go. Um, but that's where that hypothesis came from. The second was trying to get at the, um, whether physicians would find the system informative, comfortable, and easy to use. And then the third thing, was we wanted to under, start getting our brain around how the giving the physician control of their maps may change the interactions in the room. And specifically what we wanted to look at, we had a, a hypothesis that we would reduce the number of interactions between the physician and the person who um, runs the mapping system. And we called that person the mapper for lack of a more creative name. So we were really looking at accuracy, usability, and workflow. I have to tell you, these are three things that I'm still also, I continue to be interested in. So the way we designed this protocol um, was slightly different. So it allowed um, physicians to use the system at any point during the case that they wanted to. They had a roll-in phase of about two to three cases, and then they could use it at any point. But during that post-ablation waiting phase, we asked them to complete some critical tasks. Those critical tasks were to create a chamber and then to navigate to five points within that chamber. And they had to perform those tasks with and without the Sentier system. 
So let's look at those three things. The first is um, accuracy. We took those five points and we measured the distance between the target and when they thought they were at the target and just mathematically calculated the distance between the two. And what we found was that users were far more accurate. They were closer to the intended target when they used the command EC EP system compared to the standard, standard of care or the mapping system. How about usability? Well, so this was done based off post um, study user surveys using a five point Likert scale. And generally, I think you can see these, right? Yeah. You can see that people found the headset comfortable. They were able to access the tools. They were comfortable using the system. 93% thought it was easier to interpret than standard of care. That wasn't terribly surprising. Um, but what I thought was kind of interesting was that 87% felt like they were discovering something new about the anatomy, which means to me that when you flatten these complex geometries onto a two-dimensional display, you lose something. And when we bring that back into 3D, we're actually giving them something important to look at. How about that workflow piece, the interactions piece? Well, if you recall, I told you that there were two study things they had to uh, navigate to points and create a chamber. What we found was that the number of interactions dramatically drops off when they have to navigate to points, but it did not drop off when they were creating chambers. I have a separate theory on this that I am um, planning on studying. We can get into that in the question answer period if this is an area of interest for people. But you do see the interactions changing during different parts of the procedure. We subsequently did a sub-analysis where we took the patients that were enrolled in care and controlled the, and compared them to a control group in a two-to-one fashion that were matched for diagnosis, um, weight, because we actually think of pediatrics not as aged children, but as what size they are. And we looked at case duration and fluoroscopy time. And what we found was that the patients that were enrolled in care did not have longer cases and did not have, while there was a reduction in the fluoroscopy time, it did not turn out to be statistically significant. This is not surprising. There were only 10 patients that we enrolled in care. But we wanted to start understanding some of the um, clinical metrics that people traditionally use when adjudicating medical devices that go into the cath lab. And these are pretty standard ones. So, we learned a couple of really important things from care. These pictures are um, shared after consent was obtained from families. Um, the first and my most favorite is this little girl here. So after she consented um, for the study, for her EP study, after she consented to be part of the care study, we allowed her to look through the headset. And she thought this was about the coolest thing she'd ever seen. Why? Because she really now understood what I meant when I said I was threading catheters through her vessels and making these pretty rainbow colored art to try to figure out where to ablate. Um, she also couldn't believe that a girl had been involved in the creation of this. So lots of things that we can teach our young people. She is now an engineering student in college. Um, this, this friend of mine, um, you can see he's actually getting his IV while he's looking through the headset not because we were studying that at all. It just so happened he was so distracted when he was looking through after he also had consented for the procedure that we were able to quick get all this other stuff done. Importantly, he is a type one diabetic and ended up trying to create teaching tools for other type one diabetic children using this technology. So I think, you know, I think of this technology, I've told people this before, sort of like what computers were for my generation. Here's another way to date myself. PCs were, you know, when I was a sub 10 year old, um, but they totally changed the way that I practiced my craft as a older person. This is, I think that um, XR is the same for this generation. So what does the system look like now? We currently have our version two application. Version two also um, talks to, if you will, an electroanatomic mapping system. We have changed our hardware. We actually migrated over to Magic Leap 2. We can talk about that in the question answer period. I'm happy to discuss why. But again, 
does the same thing where it provides that real-time visualization of the model, gives control, and starts connecting systems in the lab. Our goal is to build a widgetized dashboard for the entire procedure. So what does that look like? Um, version two was actually just studied in uh, some patients over in Boston. This is taken from one of their procedures. This is a left atrial geometry. You can see this geometry looks much more complex. It is, we can, we can um, now handle this. The catheters looked at well, technology advances and we are advancing with it. And you can see he's sort of moving the geometry as he's moving his catheter around to best understand what he wants to do next. So the paradigm study, which is the interprocedural AR assessment in a 3D image guided modality study. It's a mouthful. Um, paradigm is actually completed enrollment. The sites that enrolled actually ended up just being two out of the four. Enrollment was quick. It was Mass General and Beth Israel. And the data are currently embargoed for presentation at Heart Rhythm Society, which will be in about seven weeks. So we will be excited to share um, data from Paradigm with you all very shortly. So what comes next? Well, our early data does suggest that there is increased accuracy, procedural efficiencies, and high usability with version one. Um, I anticipate that the data will show similarly for version two. Version two was FDA clear. Um, um, see what the data now are on version two, and, and hopefully we're going to get some real feedback from the field as we have a limited deployment of systems. Um, we have more sites coming online. We had a site come up in New Jersey a couple of weeks ago. They've started doing cases. We're getting a lot of very valuable feedback from them already. So I'm going to, Claudio, do you want me to keep going through the rest of the presentation and talk about Mantis, or did you want to pause here? Tell me how you would like to proceed. I think, I think we can go ahead. <clears throat> okay, great. So let me talk briefly about the Mantis system. This technology is much earlier, much, much, much earlier than what you've seen from Command EP and from Sentier. So one of the other problems that I have in my lab is, you know, there's a phrase we have that you need access to do a cath. That's it, you can't do a cath without access. So the way that most people obtain access these days, and this has literally changed over the course of my career, where we just, we just used to take a needle, feel for some anatomic landmarks and poke away. Now we are more sophisticated. We use ultrasound to do that. But as you can see here with my um, partner, the ultrasound is not placed in an easy place to look at. In fact, it's placed away from where your hands are and away from where the needle is. So you're looking over your shoulder as you're trying to put the needle in the vessel. Now, we know that your hands tend to move in the direction that your eyes are. So you have to overcompensate when you're using vascular, when you're using ultrasound for vascular access. But this seems like a problem that we could actually improve upon using mixed reality. So again, problems are visualization, the mobility, the ergonomics, and then the also the targeting, right? The way it looks right now, you just sort of see um, echo brightness instead of where your actual needle is. So the system that we've created, what you lovingly call in our early stages Mantis, is um, targeting ultrasound-based interventions. And, and we've started with vascular access because that's what I do. Um, and the goal is to try to make it simple, try to make ultrasound-guided access simple. And we want to be able to um, democratize access to care with technology. And we think that this technology may allow us to do that. So this is, this is actually an older view. This was our original probe that we used. Um, and we have two views. We have what we call the tip view. And you can see when you press this button, you can the ultrasound image gets displayed from the tip of the probe. Or you have what we call the billboard view. And in this video, we'll be able to see what that is. You'll also be able to see the tool tracking here. So this is obviously a phantom. Somebody has the ultrasound machine set up. They can use it. And what you see are these two chevrons getting closer together as the needle along its trajectory meets the plane of the ultrasound. Now, ultrasound is complex. I'm not going to tell you that it's a simple thing. In fact, it's why I'm not an imager, I think. It is really complex. But what we are trying to do, let's take it here, is show you where your needle is relative to the plane 
of the ultrasound probe so that you can literally line it up to get your vessel in the center of your field of view and then flash, get into the vessel. Okay, so once we had this very early um, prototype, we wanted to see if this actually was something that people would find interesting. So we got a user group of physicians all the way from fellows in training to interventionalists. And we asked them to perform a series of vascular acts in um, a couple of different phantoms. And we were measuring time to access, the number of access attempts, the number of needle repositions, and the quality of the access. So how does the needle enter the vessel? We'll look at that actually, right? Right there, as it turns out. Um, and then what we did was we videoed the entire event, the way the hands were moving relative so that we could count all of these things and time it. So the quality of access, when you enter a vessel, you generally want to do it at about 45 degrees. Um, you don't want to come in too perpendicular and you don't want to come in too parallel. We can get into why again later in the question answer if you want. You also want to get as central as possible. So that's what we were measuring. We were measuring the angle, what we call the angle of elevation. What was this angle? Um, how close or far the distance you were from entering from the plane of your ultrasound and then how central or were you off laterally, the azimuth. So here were the guide results for all comers and then for quality of access. What we saw was that there didn't appear to be a significant change in time to access or number of attempts, but there was a reduction in the number of needle repositions when using Mantis. Now, if we looked at quality of access, the distance and angle of elevation were both improved using Mantis than using traditional ultrasound, but the azimuth remained unchanged. Now, what I didn't share with you is that we actually had an anatomic variant as part of our um, testing, as part of our phantom, which was great because what we found is that as soon as we sub-analyzed the anatomic variant, time to access was lower, the number of access attempt of attempts was fewer and the number of needle repositions were fewer, as well as improvements in the quality of access. Now, vascular variants are actually present in about 36% of people. And they're specifically more seen in children, um, people with chronic diseases, and elderly females. So populations that we typically use medical devices for or to, that is the group that was likely to that will likely see the most benefit from this. So what about the physician usability results? Well, it was also pretty good. Um, generally, they felt the headset was comfortable, that the system was easy to use, both at 87%. But the one that I thought was really important, they believed that Mantis could decrease failed vascular access attempts and could help decrease adverse outcomes. And we define that as inadvertent punctures. Those were pretty high especially for people who had never used the system before, who had about 15 minutes of training before going into the, um, into the study protocol. So what did we learn? Uh, we learned a lot. And as we were talking, um, some, friend of our, some friends of ours who actually work at Walter Reed, they thought that this might actually be an important application in far forward treatment for our um, soldiers and in battlefield medicine. So, we worked to create a collaborative research and development agreement with Walter Reed to study that. We also have obviously ongoing research for civilian use cases. And while we have started with vascular access, you could easily imagine that we field lots of incoming calls on using this sort of thing in other areas of the body. So we are working on rapid prototype versioning and testing. We are currently working on a wireless probe and updates to the user interface. So updating both the hardware and the software and testing the hypothesis if technology can democratize access to this procedure. So where does mixed reality live for procedural EP? It actually doesn't just live in St. Louis. It's places. It lives in Poland where the, that group is working on an AR system for pulmonary vein isolation. It lives in Haifa where the group, um, where the real view group is working on real time holographic anatomy display for interventional procedures. Yes, it's also happening in Boston, not surprisingly, where they were looking at integration of scar data from MRI for these EP procedures. 
and the San Francisco group, um, EchoPixel, was working on this for left atrial appendage occlusion in patients with atrial fibrillation. And then, of course, our group here in St. Louis. So we believe that the interventional lab of the future, and this is actually not a paper that I wrote or had anything to do with, so I even like it even more. Um, I do think it is going to have an AR system in it. I do think it is going to have voice-assisted control, but I think this is still under construction. I do think it will have clinical decision support. These are also under construction. And then and finally, will there be a robotics integration? I feel like I get asked this fairly frequently. Probably, probably, but probably not soon um, would be my assessment of that. We can also get into why I think that. So our lessons learned, my lessons learned certainly, is that medical XR technologies are coming to maturity in certain subspecialties. And I think that the minimally invasive fields are charging their way forward. So that's interventional AP, interventional cardiology, and interventional radiology. I think interprocedural MXR is going to be a highly regulated space. I think that's probably appropriate. <laughs> um, and I think we should work with our regulator colleagues to understand what needs to happen so that these tools are deployed in a safe way for patient needs. The early data is very promising, but we still have a lot to learn. Um, and these technologies, coupled with smart UX and UI, coupled with smart development and clinical decision support tools, and events will synergistically impact the way we perform minimally invasive procedures. I think medical XR applications are going to change the way we treat patients and practice medicine. I imagine my kids will practice medicine if they decide to do this in a very different way um, than even I can imagine standing here today. I have a bunch of people that I'd like to acknowledge. Most importantly, our team at Centiar, my co-founder, John, my co-founder, Mike, our CEO, Burke, um, and all of these folks, particularly my colleagues here at WashU, who allow me to do all of this. I'm going to end here. How's that, Claudio? Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Jennifer, for... Uh, taking us into uh, a journey, really, uh, of uh, innovation. And uh, I ask you to continue because uh, in describing Mantus not only because of the, mm, in, in the interest of time, but really because uh, although different applications, I think, came from uh, similar, again, needs, clinical needs to improve processes, to improve uh, uh, the quality of the processes and to make them more efficient, more precise. And uh, the two examples that you uh, brought us today are uh, in definitely in line with that. Um, I start, I while I invite, obviously, people to ask questions in using uh, the, the chat box, uh, I'm happy to, um, again, insist a little bit on the process of creation and the co-creation and the co-design. Uh, I think you mentioned several times uh, the the fact that uh, from needs to innovation, from the identification of needs to the delivery of innovation, a lot of mm -hmm. figures were involved. So coming from a similar sort of uh, uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research, uh, I'm really uh, curious to know how did this happen in your center, which were the expertise which were uh, crucial uh, to, to design and develop your, your platforms? It's, it's a great question. I'm going to start by saying I've done the inverse as well, where we just had a really cool engineering problem that we wanted to solve and then try to shoehorn that into a technology. And not surprisingly, that never gained traction, right? Um, because while it was a really cool tool and a really cool solution, it wasn't actually addressing an unmet need. So I've done it both ways. Uh, obviously, one has been much more successful than the other. Uh, how does this start? It starts by, for me, talking to people that I don't run into every day, right? So every day, the people that I see are the members of my team, my other people in my division, my nurse, my my APP is right. Um, I force myself to go talk to other people too, and for me, that's specifically the engineering group. So we actually have scheduled brainstorming sessions, um, or I take engineering students that are in their masters or in whatever other program they are, and I bring them with me because what I see are 
either things that I can identify, hey, this is a problem I know we can do better, or something that I haven't even clearly identified as the problem yet, right? And I think this is actually a, um, a word of caution for clinicians. We all think we know what the problem is. We don't, as soon as you try to say it in one sentence, you actually have a very hard time doing it. But intentionally mixing people that don't naturally talk together on a regular basis, I think is the spark that you need to create novel and inventive um, solutions. So that's how we do it here. And, and we do that by just having designated spots on the calendar where we meet and we talk about these things. How do we start that? If I circle back to way back when, well, I'm lucky because as I told you from being here, I've been here long enough that I worked over in engineering when I was a fellow. And so a lot of those relationships were founded so early on that it didn't even occur to me that those wouldn't be the kinds of people that I would wanna to talk to. And then as I moved through my career, I thought it was really important to have an adjunct appointment in engineering. Why? Because that's the way we keep talking to each other. There are some days that, you know, I'm sitting, I'm standing in my office today um, at the medical school, but some days I just go to the engineering school. I don't even show up to the med school. And it's intentional, right? Those conversations only happen when you're there to have them. And so I would encourage people to make themselves just a little bit uncomfortable. Talk to people you don't normally talk to. Um, learn how to share a common language, right? This is always hard because my engineering team knows very quickly that if they don't want me to get somewhere, they will start using words that I don't understand. And if I really want to know, I'm going to force them to talk to me like, talk to me like I'm a kindergartner. Explain what you're saying with words I can understand. So finding that common language and then trying to be creative together. Yeah, I can't agree more. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, one question you, you mentioned about uh, cool engineering uh, things coming up or which came up and so on. And uh, I can't help but asking, what are your expectations in terms of uh, hardware? I, uh, you you tried the several generations of uh, uh, AR and MR uh, technologies, obviously without endorsing or uh, um, supporting any particular uh, right. new device coming up, but what do, what what are your expectations to really? Um, I, I would say uh, do the last mile because I think uh, we both and all I'm sure in this uh, community uh, came up a lot of innovations in the in in the over the past five six years, especially maybe over the last decade, of course. But there is something still about usability that uh, I, 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 I think we, we can still in, in bring into, into the field. So if, if, I, if you can share your hopes in that sense. Sure, absolutely. I, I don't know that I have something super clever to say on this, by the way. I, I, I think that people want headsets that are light, right? That, are comp that they can sort of put on their head, have a short startup time and can get going with. For the applications that I'm interested in, we really need um, new that are bigger than what we currently have. Yep. Um, and I like the way that people have started approaching this idea. I think there's some really clever engineers who have heard this complaint enough that they are coming up with some very interesting solutions that I quite frankly am very interested in trying. Um, and then, you know, we're just at the beginning of our journey with, for both Sentier and for Xera. Both of those are going to need um, enhanced computational ability. We really want to be able to do as much on the headset itself as we can. Um, yeah. for, for obvious reasons in the medical environment, right? It helps to reduce latency and, and all of the other important things that we're going to be measuring that are really critically important when you're doing a procedure on a person. Um, so those are the areas that I would, that I tell everybody, quite frankly, when they ask me, but I fear that none of them are particularly clever. Everybody's <laughs> Thank you. Time for me to shut up a bit. Uh
at least with my thoughts and the report some of the questions which appeared in the q a uh, i saw uh, two three questions i think uh, <clears throat> one is more general so let's start from this one and then we go to the particular uh, the question from andrew cook uh, who, may, uh, who says uh, you mentioned the training aspects of the system such as uh, people viewing and learning about procedures remotely or outside of the lab how useful have you found this and i think this one again uh, resonates quite well with your idea and the concept of democratizing sort of access to the new lab. So if you can, if you can answer this or comment on this. It's a great question. Um, so I want to start by saying that this is not my area of specialty. I train fellows because they show up, but I'm not an educator by background. I know that's kind of a strange thing to say. Um, so I am certain that smarter people than me have thought about this very much. Here's what I can say for teaching people how to do procedures, because that is something that I do. Um, it's hard to train somebody to do a procedure, particularly when you have a lot of inputs coming in. And so if I could, um, if I remind you of what my lab looks like, I have eight screens that I'm looking at, but I'm not looking at every screen every second, right? Uh, over time, I have, um, my brain has figured out what my patterns are. I have a certain way of looking at things that I, that I like to do. I think that this will help the young person standing next to me who's like, but what are you looking at right now, right? Which is oftentimes what we're saying in the lab. What are you looking at right this minute? How did you know that? To be able to along beside me and learn experientially, which is not something we've been able to do before, right? The motto is see one, do one, teach one. That's, I mean, I hate to tell you, but I don't know how wrong that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, many areas of medicine, certainly electrophysiology um, are taught that way. And so finding ways to leverage technology to train them better so that when they are in the do one, phase of that cycle, it's not brand new for them, I think will be really important. But quite frankly, Claudia, I'd love to hear your answer for this from what your work has been. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, again, the integration of data, the integration of resources in uh, a platform which uh, can merge in a simple way, because I think we also have to pursue simplicity, as you said, the usability. I think uh, that is uh, indeed uh, the, the answer. I mean, I don't know, obviously, enough of, your, of electrophysiology to comment uh, on, on this one, but uh, I think wherever you, you mention multiple uh, screens and uh, God knows how many information comes from each of those screens. So I think it is important to un try a way to make the digital more, in a way, human. And I think uh, this mixed uh, uh, reality uh, platform, I think, can, can help us. Um, question on, from Ryan Beams, a bit more uh, technical. Obviously, he thanks uh, for the great presentation. And from a clinical perspective, how do you see the trade-offs between the HUD billboard mode uh, view above the patient and the visualization at the end of the ultrasound probe? Yeah, so that's a great question, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Ryan's a friend. Um, I think that so here's the honest answer. People are not using the tip view. And that kind of makes me mad because I really wanted it. And I kind of wanted it for my engineering team because I thought it was going to be so important. Uh, and when we did that study, not one person used it. I mean, two thirds didn't even turn it on. I was like, what? But look, look right here. Let me show you what you can do. And they're like, no, this is unhelpful. Why did they think it was unhelpful? They thought the size was too small. And what I realized was that um, the way we display imaging data, medical imaging data, is much larger than it really is, right? Like you can see that these models, that even with the sensory system, these models are very big. There's no way the heart is that big, right? We intellectually know that, but when we're looking at it, we feel much more comfortable. And the tip view, I think, was highlighting that uh, size or vessel size, more than people were actually 
they couldn't see it. They didn't, they couldn't understand it. They couldn't get their brain to interpret how to move their equipment to target this little, you know, I, I'm famous. I tell my fellows, put the needle in the hole, right? That's all this is. Put the needle in the hole. It's a very simple thing to do, um, but they couldn't do it. So I actually am in a losing battle currently with my engineering team to leave the probe view on because users aren't using it. So I'll be very curious. It is one of the things that we're going to be looking at in the study that we'll do at Walter Reed. Um, but I fear if users still don't use it, that it will go away as it probably should, right? That this is iterative design, medical yep. device design. And if in fact, nobody wants it other than Jennifer, then it shouldn't make it right to the final product. But it's an excellent question, Ryan. It may have, though. So thanks for bringing that. <laughs> the implementation of the principles of uh, the co-design. <laughs> right. So and one last question from the crowd, you Sain, um, um ask about the setup of Mantus, um, how it can be easily basically implemented in, uh, I guess, other center. Could it be easily done in the span of the day, he asks. And then he asks about the hardware, whether, uh, again, it's uh, um, compatible, I guess, with other hardware and, or uh, yeah. the choice of you, or how this was, how Magic Leap 2 that you showed was uh, yeah. um, chosen. All good questions. Um, how complicated is it to set up from concept to prototype? Mm -hmm. It actually, the, uh, it was harder than we anticipated. We, as with the way that we generally um, approach problems, the way that we, my husband approach these problems is we do a lot of the early development and de-risking within the university. We write our patents and then we decide if we think it's worthwhile taking it out of the university. So that process takes a while. Um, and the integration of the tool tracking, I thought was really important. So we were able to get some of the, just the basic ultrasound imaging stuff up and running really quickly. The tool tracking though was not um, as easy or did not take as short a time period as we would have hoped. Maybe that's the best way to say it. So not doable in a day. I find that nothing in medical device design is doable in a day, even though I really, really, really wish it were doable in a day. Um, in terms of hardware choices, why did we pick what we picked? I mean, I got to tell you, I I like a lot of these hardwares for different for different reasons. Um, like that. For, oh, let's pick on HoloLens because we used a HoloLens 2 for Mantis. Currently, that's what it lives on. I like that it doesn't have a battery pack attached to it. I like the mm. longevity of its battery. I think its field of view is adequate for what we're trying to do with that. I like that you can wear your glasses underneath it. I like that it's a pick up and go kind of um, tool. And I think that's what you need in that clinical setting. When you're doing vascular access, while there certainly are teams of people in the hospital who do vascular access. The use cases that I was worried about is when you're in the ICU and a patient's crashing and you need to quickly get access because that's generally my role in that setting. I don't want to have to find a headset, find my insert, you know, do the whole thing. I wanted it to be something you could pick up off a cart and go. Um, not the case in electrophysiology, right? Electrophysiology, when you're bringing in somebody for incredibly controlled environment. Everything is moving at the pace of the electrophysiologist. It's a different set of user needs and desires. So I think that it's important to actually know all the different hardwares. We try to make sure that we know what's out there and try to match what we need, find the hardware that matches what we need rather than locking ourselves into a hardware and sticking with it. And, and that's it, if that makes sense. So we actually try a lot before we decide on which one we're going to use. And that's why we went with HoloLens too. Will that change in the future? I don't know, probably. I, <laughs> you know, I think that hardware development is happening so rapidly. It would be embarrassing if I said we weren't going to change or adapt with time. Surely, surely. Um, to wrap up also in the interest of time and while uh, Steve obviously um, <laughs> still uh, gives us time to conclude, but uh, indeed you, you mentioned about the future and uh, of course we are looking at uh, a rapidly evolving uh, technology and uh, 
hopefully the access to this technology, of course, will will also increase. And the, the scalability is definitely one. <clears throat> maybe also this question was somewhat related to, to that. And uh, at least in our experience, uh, scalability has been uh, one of the bottlenecks. Um, do you see other uh, barriers on which in your opinion, are the main barriers for uh, uh, improving adoption of such technologies and uh, embracing the, the potential advantages. Advantages that uh, also as a um, final remark before letting you obviously reply, <clears throat> I really like your, uh, your study and your presentation because you didn't want to demonstrate uh, necessarily that uh, the care uh, in terms of uh, clinical outcomes of your patient uh, uh, increased dramatically. You, you didn't say mixed reality saved lives. I mean, you were doing a, an excellent job even without it. But the fact that you showed and also the studies that you set it up to demonstrate that uh, the solutions that you presented today improve processes, overall, obviously, will have uh, benefit uh, uh, along and down the line. So I, I really think that that's as a community, we experience, we have to try also to explain it better, uh, but uh, the advantage of processes, of improving these processes and making the life of the clinicians as end users and the others um, makes, uh, makes things better. So yeah, this is, uh, was my final remark, but I, I let you conclude about the, the, again the future. <clears throat> well, wonderful, this, this was a fantastic talk. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> Uh, it uh, and and Cla Claudio, it really um, uh, brought focus to uh, the, the the process of innovation uh, by two people who um, uh, are are very very skilled at it. Um, I I think there's um, as as much um, uh, experience in in this in this talk as you'll find uh, in in any two people. Uh, who are working in medical XR? So it's it's a very very important talk um, uh, that I, I I think will become a, a useful cu curriculum. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you and uh, thank our audience for for attending. Uh, this uh, video will be available on our website in within a week. Uh, in in case you want to go back and go go over it. So well, thank you, and um, uh, we'll look forward to. Um, uh, to, 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 to following uh, Centiar as, uh, uh, as, as the company, company grows. And uh, thank you, Claudio. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone.